by the ocean. And he went into ecstasy and he fell into the ocean. And so he was floating around in the ocean in the middle of the night. And there was this fisherman who was, was fishing, you know, throwing the net like that. And he accidentally caught Lord Chaitanya in his net. <laughs> and he pulled in his net and he touched Lord Chaitanya while the Lord was in a state of profound ecstasy. And of course, he immediately became ecstatic himself. And all the symptoms of devotional ecstasy manifested in his body. Well, he thought he had become uh, attacked by a ghost or, or, or something. What's that called? Possessed by a ghost. Because all of a sudden he was like laughing, crying, dancing, shouting, falling down all at once. <laughs> this is called Mahabhava. When there's all these symptoms occur at once. Huh? So uh, the poor fisherman, he was, he was freaking out. He thought he'd gone mad. Uh, he thought he had lost it completely. And uh, the devotees found him wandering along the ocean, you know, just like gibbering. <laughs> because they couldn't understand, or he couldn't understand, how this could be caused by anything. So because it was outside his ontology, outside his model of reality, he thought he was mad. You see? So if someone is chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and they don't know these things, they don't know what these different sy symptoms are, or what they represent or how they're linked with Krishna or what their relationship is to ordinary psychology, uh, and they start to experience these symptoms, they won't know what to do with it. You see? Just like most people don't know what to do with consciousness. So what do they do? They just ignore it. They just take it for granted, not realizing that they're having a spiritual experience. Not realizing that every night when they go into dreamless sleep, they're actually resting in the arms of Brahman. They don't know these things because they don't know the scriptures. And because they don't know the scriptures, when they do have spiritual experiences like dreams and stuff like this, they tend to just ignore it or they even forget it. You see? Just like many young children have memories of their previous life. But we tell them, or they may even have some direct perception of God. But we tell them, no, Johnny, that's just your imagination. It's just a dream. It's not real. Uh, because it's not concrete, objective, and physical. You see? But that's an incorrect interpretation of our inner experience. The real fact is spiritual things are more real than this solid, objective, material existence because they're permanent, they're spiritual, they're eternal. Whereas everything in this material world has a beginning and an end. But spiritual experiences don't because consciousness is always spiritual. Uh, that's why it can't be measured by any material thing, any material instrument or experiment. The scientists will never understand consciousness because they assume that everything has to be measurable and they can't measure it. So they say it doesn't exist. It's just a figment of your imaginary mind. <laughs> but mind doesn't exist either. And yet these scientists are so proud of their mind and their intelligence. Where is it? Can you show me your mind? Can you measure it? Can you weigh it? Huh? Can you show your mind? functioning? Well, we can measure brain waves. That's all. It's a long way from brain waves to a mind. Uh, so actually the scientists are completely off base, yet everyone pretty much accepts their story of how the world is made. So this is bogus. This is totally bogus. If we really want to know what the world is made of, it's made of spirit. It's made of pure consciousness, see? And then we ourselves are a tiny particle of that consciousness. And the, the conscious whole is called God or Krishna. And he has an individuality and we have an individuality. 
and both those individualities are eternal. See, this goes right back into the very fundamentals of what is the spirit soul, what is God? What is their relationship? So now we start talking about their relationship in terms of the experience of the jiva. What do you experience? Well, whenever you conceive of the uh, relationship of the jiva with Brahman, uh, the part with the whole, the drop with the ocean, uh, when you conceive of that relationship properly, then devotional service develops automatically. Bhakti is the symptom of self-realization, in other words. So what is bhakti? What are the different parts of bhakti? What are the functions of bhakti? What are the symptoms of bhakti? Uh, why does bhakti give us pleasure? Why, you know, what are these different manifestations of pleasure? And why do we feel them in relationship with devotional service? See, all these things we need to know. Otherwise, when they start happening to us, we'll freak out. Huh? These, these guys are so funny. They call me the freak out Acharya. <laughs> because I'm just natural about this stuff. It's not like we're, we're trying to fit devotional service into the confines of a religious organization because it won't fit. It's too big. Uh -huh. Devotional service is infinite. It's unlimited. It's eternal. So if we start talking about, well, we have this ritual and that will give you divine love or something like that, that's just bogus. It's so limited. No. We say everything that the living entity does can be dovetailed with devotional service to Krishna if it's done as an offering of the energy of the Lord back to the Lord himself. It's a very broad principle. It's a, it's a very, very um, robust platform of spiritual consciousness. And it gives direct realization of the Supreme Person. See, therefore, it's more than religion. It's the perfection of religion. Self-realization. You see? Direct personal relationship with the Lord. Right? And we get to keep our identity, we get to keep our personality. It doesn't involve any loss of anything, but we only gain a whole new dimension of existence in our lives. And everyone who's become a devotee knows this. But if they don't have the vocabulary, how can they explain it to others? Huh? Or how can they explain it to themselves? And if you can't explain something to yourself, then you're going to lose that benefit. See, it's just like, what was that? It's just like if you are writing music and you come across this really cool sounding chord, but you don't have enough music theory to remember, to, to explain to yourself how the chord is constructed. Now, how are you going to remember that chord? See, or its relationship with other chords and so on. Oscar, if I can explain, all right. it has to be beyond words. No, it, no, it's not beyond words. Transcendental sound vibration has the ability to explain things that are beyond the material platform. That's why when we chant Sanskrit very nicely, we get so many realizations. Huh? Because the, the transcendental sound vibration contains within it the actual state of consciousness that is needed to realize whatever it's talking about. So why, by learning these terms, anubhav, bhava, samadhi, uh, prema, and so on, all these terms, there are over 250 terms in the Vedic literatures that describe different flavors of ecstatic transcendental love. 250 terms. In English, we're so poverty-stricken. Huh? Either I like you, or I love you, or I hate you. <laughs> you know, there's like so many limited... Like you go in the ice, one ice cream store, and they have, they have chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. That's it. Huh? 
Or you go in the Vedic ice cream store, they have 250 flavors. <laughs> uh -huh. So just see. Uh -huh. It's just like I was saying before about Elvis Presley and Beethoven. Uh -huh. Elvis Presley is like one flavor, right? Not a very good flavor either. But Beethoven, oh, there's all these possibilities. So many different moods, so many different expressions, you see? So there's no discussion about it. I mean, that Beethoven is, is intrinsically superior to Elvis Presley. Right? Nobody, even that doesn't like Beethoven, would ever try to disagree with that. Huh? Because it's completely stupid that, that, that Presley could be more. No, impossible. So the same way, the vocabulary and the philosophy of devotional service is so far beyond 